take one marker. We live in an era when the number one difference maker in the industry truly is design. In an age when you can call five, six, seven different companies to make you a tourbillon, a perpetual calendar, a retropont, or something yet to be imagined, the real difference maker isn't the engineering anymore, it's the way the watch looks. Now, there are two ways to look at this. First, you can look at it longitudinally from the beginning of the watch industry, or at least the wristwatch industry to the present. And then you can look at it from a transverse perspective across the industry today to see the impact that design is having as a difference maker in the current industry. As the watch industry transitioned from pocket watches to wristwatches during the early 20th century, the closest analog to the way the watch industry worked would have been the auto industry, which is to say, in the earliest days of Oldsmobile and Ford and even General Motors, the engineer who created the car was also the individual who designed the body. It was considered nothing more than a package, a vessel for the engineering. So for the most part, you would see engineering within the company that built the product, the car or the watch, and then outside specialists would be brought in to create style, to create design. Oftentimes, the specialists would have nothing to do with the watch brand or the automaker, and thus we saw the rise of coach builders during the 1920s and 30s in the auto industry and the rise of freelance watch designers in the wristwatch industry. So in 1927, General Motors created the art and color section. It was effectively the first in-house design department. And they brought in Harley Earl, who came from a family of horse-drawn coach builders and later automobile body constructors to be the head of the art and color section. The watch industry would trail by approximately seven decades this critical development. There were a few notable distinctions and a few that set themselves apart, but for the most part, prior to the 1990s, watch design was something that was outsourced. It was never in-house. Now, there were some exceptions, and it's important to note that during the 1950s, we saw the first progressive watch brands, such as Omega, bringing shop foremen and project managers, such as Rene Bonvard before his Corum days, into the design process in-house. And we also saw at Patek Philippe the remarkably prescient decision to bring in a young jewelry designer phenom named Gilbert Albert to do in-house design work for the Patek Philippe brand. But for the most part, in those days, people like a young Gerald Genta were getting paid a few Swiss francs to design the watches, and oftentimes they were being paid by case-making specialists, not the watch brands themselves. In those days, the freelance designer conducted the de design work often for a case maker that was subcontracted by the actual watch brand, and the brand was paramount. You would never know who designed the Rolex Oyster. You would never know who originally designed an iconic Patek Philippe watch of the 1950s, something like a perpetual calendar chronograph, an automatic perpetual calendar, or an A-magnetic. This began to change during the 1960s, and I think one of the seminal moments was probably when Gerald Genta, then known as a phenomenal jewelry designer with a reputation inside the watch industry, established his eponymous brand. And this was a standout. The whole notion of a designer putting his name on a brand. After decades in which the designer had been subsumed under the header of the brand, the brand dominant, suddenly the designer and the brand were one and the same. But that did not mean that we'd stepped beyond the realm of anonymity in the life of the contractor. Gerald Genta's work for Audemars Piguet on the 1972 Royal Oak, for example, wasn't commonly known for years. And the initial patents for the Patek Philippe Nautilus of 1976 were in the name of the Stern family. So anonymity, as well as contracted design, continued to dominate the industry. Over the years, you would see company principals, such as the Stearns, step in to do some design work. You would see the likes of Patek Philippe bring in their ad agencies to consult on design. And even as late as the 1990s, you would see the likes of Vacheron Constantin bringing in freelance designers such as Dino Modolo, a designer more commonly associated with Corum, to help create the original 1996 Overseas. You didn't see the beginning of a wristwatch equivalent of General Motors' old art and color section until the 90s. And that's when you began to see the arrival of in-house designers who worked for the brand, with the brand, and no longer in anonymity. And I think one of the transformational moments was probably Basel World 1993 when Audemars Piguet displayed the Royal Oak Offshore. It was phenomenal, 
because it was huge. 42 millimeters was monstrous at the time, and it was a significant evolution of Gerald Genta's Royal Oak. In fact, Genta himself took offense, but it was a young designer named Emmanuel Get, who was employed by Audemars Piguet, who actually had the assignment within the company to create a 20th anniversary evolution of the original Royal Oak. Originally a monstrous concept watch, the Royal Oak Offshore became a phenomenon and gets name with it. That leads us into the modern era in which individuals like Emmanuel Get at Audemars Piguet or Yannick Delaskevitz at Jeger Le Coult, or even at Vacheron, subsequent to his initial work on the overseas with Dino Modolo, Vincent Kaufman, began to establish in-house design agencies. What would have been outsourced, perhaps even to a case maker in previous generations, became a matter of a corporate mandate, pride, necessity. Just as movements would later be brought in-house, design was slowly brought in-house. And today, you would be hard pressed to find a single watch brand, including Rolex, that does not employ dedicated art specialists, people who are able to conceive and execute and ultimately work with the production engineers to create designed products. It's almost mandatory today for a company to have an art department, especially since today, when you can call white label engineering houses, the likes of which have multiplied in the last 30 years and immediately have an in-house caliber the next week that you can call exclusive. It's no longer special to be able to make your own movement. Almost anyone can do it, complications included. But consider the example of Nomos, a company that does have in-house calibers, extraordinarily all developed outside the ranks of the major groups. What's Nomos known for in the modern age? They're known for design. So much so that they've established a separate design office. Their company is based in Glasuta, the traditional center of German watchmaking. But their office for the design team is in Berlin. Berlin is now, for design purposes, the equivalent of Brooklyn. It's hip, it's young, it's disruptive, and Nomos's design team, which does nothing but design Nomos watches all day long, is supplemented by outside designers, and they've brought in the likes over the years of Hannes Wettstein, the late Swiss designer, to design the Zurich, the recent Autobahn, designed by Werner Eislinger, a noted furniture designer, brought in to work with Nomos's team in Berlin, and that'll be publicized in press releases. There'll be glamour photos of him in his studio working on Nomos products. Or you'll see the likes of Rado, a Swatch brand group, working with noted interior designers like Rainer Mutsch on the designer series. And that's correct, they have a designer series every year working with a different designer or design team. Because in an era when anyone can have a tourbillon with a single phone call, a winning design can define a brand. It's great to build your own movement, but show me a brand that only has iconic movements and no iconic design, and I'll show you a failing brand. During the 2000s, even as double, triple, quadruple tourbillon watches became common, the real winners that defined the era became the design houses. That's how the likes of an Hublot was able to give Audemars Piguet, an ancient holy trinity watch brand, a run for its money. That's how Audemars Piguet was able to raise its Royal Oak Offshore, a model powered for the first 10 years of its life by a Chagere Le Coult movement with the Dubois de Pras module on top, and that became the defining Audemars Piguet of the 2000s and one of the leading designs of the modern era. It's important to note that there will be companies that continue to adhere to the old ways, and at Rolex, I doubt we'll ever know the names or the faces of the folks who create the modern watches, the Milgauss GV, the Yachtmaster II, the Deep Sea, or the Deep Sea Deep Blue. Nevertheless, it's important to remember that the strongest watches and the strongest brands are defined by design. When you think of Patek Philippe, do you think of the caliber 324 SC, or do you think of the Nautilus, the Aquanaut, the Calatrava. When you think of Audemars Piguet, do you concern yourself with calibers 3120, 3126? More likely you think of the Royal Oak and the Royal Oak Offshore. And when you think of Vacheron Constantin, which only became a manufacturer during the 2000s, chances are you can't name one of their movements. But the American 1921, the overseas, you know those. That's just proof that good design is essential because this is an emotional business. In a purely engineering-driven profession, an engineering-driven trade or industry, you could get by just with the machine. 
And there are plenty of industries where you create the best medical device or drilling equipment and you're gonna be the industry leader. But no one needs a mechanical watch. It's purely a function of the wallet and the heart that draws a person to a brand. And in an era when miracles are possible by virtue of computer-assisted modeling, computer-assisted design, engineers who do nothing but design movements all day long, and complications that even Breguet himself could never have imagined, it's the simple design. It's the Ming. It's the Nomos Zurich. It's the Rado True Thin Line that catches the eye, yes, but also captures the heart. This has been The Importance of Design and Designers in the Watch Industry. This is The Watch Box. I'm Tim, and thanks for logging on.